But as we welcome you to uh, this simple gathering of followers of Jesus, um, <clears throat> our desire, our goal in all of this is to know and love and serve God um, more fully. We really pray that we would know Jesus better at the end of this than we do right now. And uh, it's kind of our constant prayer. So um, welcome everyone as we do that. And today is officially the first day of autumn. Uh, this is what autumn looks like in New England. Um, that picture, I believe, is probably from Maine. Um, but it could be Vermont or New Hampshire or Massachusetts or any of those places. So if you've never experienced an autumn in New England, uh, you should put that on your bucket list. Um, Jesus has told us that we have to have a righteousness that exceeds, is superlative to, that of the scribes and Pharisees, which, you know, as we pointed out before, must have been just an absolutely shocking statement because the scribes and Pharisees were considered the most righteous people around. I mean, they were so religious and so diligent and so disciplined in all that they did. Uh, so that, I, I'm sure, really uh, woke people up when Jesus said that. The word that's translated righteousness is this Greek word, dikaiosune, um, <clears throat> which does not mean, um, uh, Paul uses the word to speak of a gift, um, but Matthew does not use the word this way. This is not the way Jesus is using it. Uh, Dikaiosune here um, could be translated justice. It means to do the right thing with the right motive, doing the right thing for the right reasons. Uh, Dikaiosene is true inner goodness that results in good works. It's having one's character conform to the image of Christ, um, being uh, uh, spiritually formed, shaped in such a way that good works naturally flow from you. <clears throat> um, so Jesus, as I said, um, said <laughs> that our righteousness, our dikaiosenu, must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. So far in the Sermon on the Mount, we have seen that Jesus came to proclaim, to announce, to introduce the kingdom of God. And the first people that are welcomed into the kingdom of God are those who are described in the Beatitudes, the poor, the meek, the bereaved, the spiritually hungry, uh, the peacemakers, the pure at heart, all those people that are described uh, in the um, those Beatitudes, and undoubtedly uh, there were people in each of those categories right in front of him as he was sharing. So first he proclaims the kingdom, then he makes it plain that this kingdom is not for the high and mighty, the movers and shakers, the, from the worldly point of view, important people, quote unquote, but this kingdom is for, is upside down. It's for the, the, the lowly and the meek and the poor and the bereaved and so forth. Um, then Jesus went on in the Sermon on the Mount to tell us that he did not come to do away with Torah, but instead he came to show us a new wisdom which is under those laws in the first five books of the Bible. Um, he's essentially telling us, in the light of Christ, with the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, if we meditate on the Torah, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we will come to see that there is godly wisdom which is underneath all of those instructions, which of course um, are, are very old and very dated. They were dated at the time of Jesus. Um, then he went on to tell us that we need to be careful not to do righteous things, not to do good deeds in order to be seen. And he gives three examples, almsgiving, prayer, and fasting. Now, you could add other things to that too, like Bible reading, for example, or witnessing to others. Uh, these are all uh, spiritual disciplines, practices which are designed to draw us close to God, 
Um, and they're important. We need to be doing them, but we need to be careful that we're doing them for the right reason, not to be seen. And why is that so important? It's so important because God is inviting us to join him in making all things new. He's invited us into this kingdom, um, not just so that we can, you know, be blessed or be forgiven or go to heaven when we die, but he's invited us into this kingdom so that we could join him here and now in his ministry, which is in the process of making all things new. So we join God by making all things new, by promoting the well-being of the kingdom of God, uh, proclaiming the, the gospel of Jesus, uh, working for the well-being of other people, of ourselves, and of creation. But there are two things, according to Jesus, that will keep us from joining God as God makes all things new. We're invited to join God, but there are two things that will prevent us from doing that. The first one is the desire to have the approval of others. And that's where those examples, uh, almsgiving and prayer and fasting, come in. Um, the desire for approval for others. We, we need to learn that we play to an audience of one, that there's only one being in the universe that it really matters whether or not uh, that God is the only one in the universe that it really matters whether he is pleased with us or not. Uh, so the desire to have approval of others, to be seen of others, that'll keep us out of the flow of God's Spirit. And the second thing that'll keep us out of the flow of God's Spirit, and this is the section of uh, the Sermon on the Mount that we're entering into now, is the desire to uh, secure ourselves with material wealth, the desire to secure ourselves with material wealth. So, the righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, uh, the uh, dikaiosune that exceeds the dikaiosune of the righteous of the Pharisees, it is a righteousness. It's it's doing good, but it seeks approval only from God, not to impress others. And it seeks security in God, not in wealth or possessions. So, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, he says, and of course this is a very famous passage, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moss and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but instead store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Uh, the word translated heaven is literally heavens, in the heavens, plural. Um, it, it's a reference to the sky, um, to what we see when we look up. Um, <clears throat> that, of course, is a figure of speech, which is referring to the realm that is exclusively the realm of God and angels and spirits of people made perfect and so forth. Um, it's that realm that's described in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. It's that realm which is not, it's, it isn't up there in the sky, it's all around us. We're just not aware of it most of the time. It's God's realm, exclusively God's realm. Of course, uh, the realm we live in is also God's realm because God created everything. And God's goal in this whole process, God's plan in this whole process, is to bring about the unification of heaven and earth, to bring about the unification of the realm where the angels live and the realm where we live, uh, making it one so that it's restored to the way it was originally sent to be. Um, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, Jesus said. Now, why this talk about treasure? Well, it all has to do with security. And it's perfectly natural, <clears throat> in fact, it would be very unnatural for any human being to feel like they don't need to need 
safety. I mean, it's it, it's instinctive. It's built in, not just with humans, but with, with pretty much all living creatures, as far as we know. Uh, all humans desire to be safe. Our problem is that we mistakenly think that things other than God can keep us safe. Uh, we think, you know, if we have enough guns or locks or enough cops on the beat, uh, then we'll be safe. We think, well, if I have enough insurance or I have a big savings account or I have the proper investments, then um, I, I know that I'm covered. I know everything's going to be taken care of. I'll be able to, you know, pay whatever bills are coming and, um, you know, have good food to eat and I, I, I won't be a, um, I won't starve in old age, that kind of thing. Um, we, we, we look to things other than God for our security. And, you know, this is an election season, and um, I, I, I'm sure you have noticed how politicians are stirring up fears, the fear of others, to motivate people to vote for them because they claim they're going to keep us safe. I mean, listen to the ads, you know, there's a wide open border and, and, and uh, you know, criminals by the, by the droves are pouring across and 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 they're taking over our towns and they're taking over our villages and they're they're eating our dogs and cats and um you know we need to get rid of these people and so forth and so on uh, why are they doing that why are the politicians doing that they know these are lies they, they know they're it's completely false they're doing it to make people afraid and then they are offering themselves as an answer to the fears um you should be afraid because this, that, and the other thing are happening, and you should elect me because I'm the one that can protect you. Um, I, I've heard numerous Christians um, talk about the fact that um, um, that they are voting for a particular party because they're convinced that the uh, person running for office is going to keep Christians safe. Well, Christians don't need politicians to keep them safe. We have Jesus. Our mistake, coming back to the text, is seeking security and wealth. And that's easy to do. In fact, it's uh, almost impossible to avoid, I think, especially in our particular culture. Because uh, here in the United States, in North America in general, our economy is based on continuous on the continuous extraction of non-renewable resources. They're going to run out in order to feed an insatiable consumerism. As Emerson said, things are in the saddle and they ride mankind. What we're doing with all this stuff is we're trying to arrange a world in which all of our needs are met without God. We, we want to be secure, and we want to be tangibly secure. Uh, we, we don't really want to have to rely on God. We want to make sure we've got things in place, and then if there's anything we've missed, well, maybe God can pick up on that. And so we live in a culture where um, it, it's, it's considered a great virtue to be wealthy, to be rich. Um, in, in fact, there are... Um, I am. Um, <laughs> I, I started to say there are false prophets around. I think I'll stick with that. There are false prophets around um, uh, who try to tell us that uh, wealth, material wealth, uh, is a sign of God's blessing. Well, look at what James says in chapter five. And and this, remember, this is Jesus' brother. Um, by the way, James, the book of James. Um, is the best commentary we have on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, James, Jesus' younger brother, says, Come now, you rich people, weep and wail for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your clothes are moth-eaten. Moth your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will be evidenced against you, and it will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure during the last days. Listen, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. 
You have lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure. You have nourished your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous one who does not resist you. In the first century, uh, wealth was measured differently than it is now. Um, with some overlap. Um, if you owned land, uh, just as today, that, that was a sign of wealth. But as far as um, storing up wealth, you know, storing up against a rainy day, so-called, um, in the first century, the two main ways you would do that would be to buy and store bolts of cloth and or you would um, keep big piles of coins. Didn't have paper money in those days, but there were lots of coins. And so, you know, the more coins you had in your coin chest, the wealthier you were. Um, they didn't have artificial dyes like they do today. Um, and so um, some colored, uh, well, most, most garments were just plain white, um, but uh, those that were dyed, you know, it, it had to be dye that was made naturally. Um, and one of the most expensive dyes would be to to uh, uh, dye the cloth purple, well, which is why it became the color of royalty, because it was so expensive. Because the way in ancient times to get purple dye, they were uh, there was a certain insect that they would harvest and crush uh, to make the purple dye. Um, so uh, it was a way to invest your wealth. Uh, you'd buy up, you're a wealthy person, you don't know what to do with all your money. So you, so you buy up a whole bunch of, of, of bolts of, of purple cloth and scarlet cloth and blue cloth and so forth. And you have big piles of coins sitting around. That's why Jesus talks about uh, cloth and coins in, in this section uh, of the Sermon on the Mount. Today, of course, we generally measure wealth in terms of cash and stocks and bonds and real estate and uh, possessions. Uh, some people measure it in terms of cryptocurrency these days, uh, which doesn't even feel like a real thing to me, but whatever. Um, Jesus says, don't treasure up for yourself treasures on the earth. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on the earth, or literally do not treasure up treasures for yourself on the earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break through and steal when he talks about treasures he's talking about money he's talking about wealth he's talking about investments he's talking about things we value things that we store up um, in his day uh, a lot of that was as i said cloth and coins he says, don't do that because the, the in, first of all, it's, it's temporary. It's not going to last. Uh, moths can get into the cloth and ruin it. <clears throat> and rust can destroy the coins. Um, the word that's translated rust here in our text is literally eaters. Um, it means anything that devours. Um, it was first translated as rust uh, when Jerome translated the uh, Greek and Hebrew uh, scriptures into um, Latin, the, the Latin Vulgate. That was about 404 AD. He used the word uh, rust to, uh, to, uh, in Latin to translate this word, uh, which literally is eaters. But so, so it's a broader word. It means devouring insects like moths. It means uh, vermin, you know, mice, that kind of thing. Uh, Areomachasis, anything that, that destroys, that eats up stuff. Areomachasis is a fun word that you don't hear very often. Uh, it means a gradual oxidation from exposure to air and moisture. Uh, anything that's, that's um, uh, disintegrating, that's rusting, that's... Um, decaying that all falls under that category so in the case of storing up cloth or coins um, the the you know cloth can decay it can be eaten by moths um, the coins 
also eventually will decay, uh, rusting away, as it were. And of course, he says uh, also uh, thieves break in and steal. Any form of wealth can be stolen, um, whether it's sophisticated cyber crime or whether it's old fashioned stick em up crime. Um, in Luke chapter 16, uh, right between the parables of the dishonest servant and the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, Um, which are both about how we use the money that God has given us. Uh, the scripture says that the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all this and they ridiculed Jesus. And Jesus said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of others. That's always a bad idea when we think we have to justify ourselves in the sight of others. Let, let God justify you, you know. But God knows your hearts. For what is prized by humans is an abomination in the sight of God. Those are powerful words. Um, the way of the world is to hoard, to store up, to uh, uh, collect, to hold on to as much as you can in order to feel secure, in order to feel safe. And the less secure... a person was during their growing up years, probably the stronger that instinct is to, to collect and to hold on and to, uh, I, I, I've got to, you know, have enough. I mean, my, my mother, bless her heart, I mean, she was a child of the Depression. Um, she was an adult during the, during the Great Depression. Um, and it, it, like many in that generation, it made an indelible mark on her. And, and on the one hand, there was, there was some good that came out of that. She was extremely frugal. She was very careful. But the downsides was she was always worried. Uh, up until the day she died at the age of 98, she was worried, terrified sometimes, that she would run out of money, that there wouldn't be enough, that, that you know, she spent her last months in a nursing home, She's worried who's going to pay the bill, how we're going to, you know. Um, and, um, you know, it was, it, it was sad to, to see that. Um, so the world's way is to, to, to collect, to save, to protect, to keep. The kingdom way is exactly opposite. It's radical generosity. Jesus, speaking to the rich young ruler, said, if you wish to be perfect, and the word there is telos, which means if you wish to be spiritually mature, if you wish to be spiritually complete, go sell your possessions, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. He went away sorrowing. Um, Zacchaeus, on the other hand, who had made a lot of money uh unscrupulously um when he was confronted with jesus uh he, he gave most of it away he he restored he said anybody i've cheated come talk to me i'll i'll, I'll make it good fourfold you know um radically different he 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 got it he understood the kingdom way he understood his heart was transformed to the place where he experienced that radical generosity. Paul says essentially the same things in 1 Timothy 6, where he says, of course, there's great gain in godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into this world and so that we can take nothing out of it. You know, I, I've, uh, over the years, I've done a lot of funerals um, and memorial services and such. I have, and a lot of graveside burials, but I, I have, Yet to see uh, a hearse towing a U-Haul trailer. You can't take it with you. I mean, it's so so obvious, and yet uh, somehow we think maybe we can. There was a guy years ago that was uh, died and was buried in Las Vegas. He wanted to be buried in his Cadillac convertible, um, and I think he was, <laughs> as if. as if he could ride that into the next life or something. Um, we brought nothing into this world so we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, 
we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The love of money. You hear that misquoted all the time. Money's the root of all evil. That's not what Jesus said. He said the love of, I mean what Paul said. He said the love of money is one of the roots, a root, of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Having a surplus always gives us a sense of false security. So God's calling us to invest, not in stuff, but in the new creation. And how do we invest in the new creation? By uh, dikaios sune, uh, by doing good, doing right by God, doing right by others, doing right by the environment, doing right by ourselves, with hearts that are right with God. That's how we invest in a new creation. And, and part of that investment is the acknowledgement that Jesus is Lord, that God is God of the entire universe, that God is alive and God is active, and God loves us and takes care of his children, and therefore we can trust God. Just like the ancient Jews in the wilderness, give us this day our daily bread. Give us what we need for today. Uh, and if you give me what I need for today, which God always will, then I'm content, Paul is saying. Then I'm at rest. I don't, I don't need to worry about tomorrow because if, first of all, tomorrow is not promised to any of us. Jesus might come back this evening, you know. Um, but if he does give us tomorrow... He'll provide for us tomorrow. Where God guides, God provides. So invest in the new creation by doing right by God and right by others and right by yourself and right by the beautiful creation that God has put around us. And if we will do that, then God will reward our generosity. Remember the parable over in uh, Matthew chapter 20? It's in the first 16 verses or so. It's the parable of the workers in the field. It's, it's one that, that um, uh, I think bothers a lot of us because um, you, you know the story. There's a guy that has a field and there's uh, um, a bunch of uh, uh, out of work people standing, standing around in the marketplace hoping somebody will, will uh, employ them. And uh, he, he needs to bring in his crops. And so he hires one group of people. He says, I'll pay you X amount for a day's work. And they go off to work. And then a few hours later, he hires another group. And a few hours after that, another group. And uh, an hour before quitting time, he hires another one. And then when it's all over, what does he do? He pays them all exactly the same thing. And the ones that work the longest say, hey, that doesn't seem fair. We worked all day long, and these guys only worked an hour. And he said, I, I, I'm, I'm just being generous. Why are you mad at me for being generous? You know, I, I, I gave you what I promised to give you, what you agreed to, um, you know, a fair and generous wage. And if I want to be even more generous with these other people, that's my business. Well, the point there is that God's economy is not a quid pro quo economy. God is indiscriminately liberal with his resources. God pours out uh, the rain on the just and the unjust. He sends sunshine to good people and bad people both. Um, God has, has um, no shortage of everything that we need and is ready to lavish those things on us, whether whether we've been at work in the field all day or just for an hour. So the point is that Jesus is calling us to trust God on a daily basis to provide for us, to, to realize that while society is telling us that we need to um, establish our own security, 
We need to make ourselves secure. So we need guns and locks and we need cops and we need big bank accounts and we need careful investments and we need to make sure that we've got all the contingencies covered and everything's, you know, well, we need to provide for our own security. Society keeps telling us that. And society keeps telling us that uh, anything that's left over, we should use for our own pleasure because the um, security and pleasure give all, give value to life. But that's a lie. There is a reality that's unshakable, and it comes from following Jesus, from doing what he says to do in the Sermon on the Mount. It comes in this particular instance from <clears throat> taking the things that God has given us, the, the wealth that God has given us, uh, the stuff that we have, and using it to love other people in however God directs us to do that. Now, of course, this comes up sometimes. Uh, there are other things that we treasure that are non-material, things like relationships and memories. Uh, we treasure those. Um, and I don't think it's stretching the point to say that a, a, this passage, sort of a subtext of this passage, would be teaching us to treasure nothing uh, more than we treasure God. Um, but to keep it in context, Jesus' point here has to do with material treasures, um, not about relationships, not about memories. Um, God is all for strong relationships and beautiful memories. Um, but his point here in this passage is it has to do with material stuff, the stuff that we look to for security. Don't treasure up for yourself treasures in heaven. I'm sorry, I said that completely wrong. Do not treasure up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but treasure up for yourselves treasures in the heavens where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your heart is your will. It's your spirit. It's the inner essence of who you are. And what we treasure, what we hang on to, what we cling to in life is what we love. And we hang on to it because we're placing our security in those things that we're hanging on to. Instead, Jesus says, be like I am. Be like God is. Be liberal. Be generous. Use your resources to do good. Use your resources to advance the kingdom of God. Use your resources to uh, protect the environment. Use your resources to uh, help other people. Use your resources to um, in, in, invest in yourself you know, in, in drawing closer to, to the Lord, you know, maybe that's the, a, a book you need to buy or uh, a conference you want to attend or, you know, those kinds of things. Use your resources to do good. That's what we're talking about when we talk about treasures in the heavenlies, uh, in the heavens, that sky treasure. What is it? <clears throat> what is heavenly treasure? Well, it's all the things God gives us. It's joy. It's unending life. It's responsibility over this new creation that God is in the process of, of renewing. Um, the, the unity, the love, the peace, the well-being, the shalom that we experience with one another and in the presence of God, all of that, all of that, you bundle all that together, that's heavenly treasure. And that's what needs to be spent. Heavenly treasure is always meant to be spent, never to be saved up. You, you can't just save up, you know, until you've, until you've got 16 gallons of love and then start giving it out. Love doesn't work that way. Um, as the children's ditty says love isn't love until you give it away. Um, the more generous we are 
with God's grace, with God's love, with God's uh, resources, um, the more secure we are in the arms of Jesus. And this heavenly treasure that he's talking about, where your heart is, there your, your treasure will be also. He's not just talking about in the sweet by and by. Now, we are going to be rewarded in the next life. And, you know, that's great. Praise God. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Um, he's talking about having this treasure right now. The presence of Jesus. The wisdom of the Holy Spirit. The care of God the Father. We have these things right now but we don't have them just to make us feel warm and fuzzy. We have them so that we can give them away, so that we can share them with other people, so that others also can experience the presence of Jesus and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and the care of the Father. Notice the tenses in uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22 and following. But you have come to Mount Zion. Notice the tense there. You have already come to Mount Zion. It's not future. Uh, he's not saying you're, you're going to someday you're going to get to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And oh, what a glorious day that's going to be. And now, that's true. What I just said is true. But that's not what Hebrews is talking about here. It's talking about a present reality. We have in this life now already come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, we have in this life now come to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is where we are now. It's not just a description of what we're going to get in the next life. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is talking about what we do with the material things that God has given us now in this life. And he's saying, let go, be generous, share, use it to help others, use it to advance the kingdom of God, use it to protect the environment. Use it to bring yourself closer to God and to provide for the needs of people around you, to, to promote justice and well-being. Use what God has given you now because you are part of this kingdom. You, you have already come to Mount Zion, the throne, uh, the, the throne room of the king, as it were, the city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem. That's our home. That's where we live now. Innumerable angels in festal gathering. They're all around us. We're just not aware of it most, most of the time. We've come to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. What a beautiful description of the Christian church that is. And we've come to God and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Even those who've gone on to be with the Lord, they're, they're part of our fellowship. And we've come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. And we're experiencing the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. We have come to Mount Zion. We are invited to take everything God has given us and to invest it in the kingdom of God. We are invited to above all all else treasure God. What does it mean to treasure God? It means to hold God dear. It means to guard God's reputation. It means to join God in making all things new. Treasuring God is loving and adoring God with your whole heart, mind, body, and soul with all that you are, with all that you possess, with all that God has entrusted you with. Treasure God. Lay up for yourselves treasures in the heavens. Lay up for yourselves sky treasure. <laughs> 
know that you're part of this heavenly realm with the angels and the saints made perfect and all that. You're part of that now. Recognize that. Trust God. Give us this day our daily bread. Trust God day to day. I was young, now I'm old. King David said, never seen God's seed begging bread. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. So I ask you as we close, what is it that makes you feel secure? And, you know, try, try to be honest. <laughs> I, I mean, you are honest, I know that. But in questions like that, it's so easy for me to, to give the Christian answer, you know, uh, kind of the knee-jerk answer. What makes you feel secure? Jesus, my relationship with Jesus. Well, yeah, okay, good. But really, <laughs> what makes you feel secure in life? And what in your life would you find hard to let go of and, and why? So those are some things to consider. Father God, we pray in the precious, loving, holy name of Jesus that you would help us, Lord, to be doers of your word and not just hearers. You told us not to lay up for ourselves treasures on earth where moss and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. So help us not to. And you told us to lay up for ourselves treasures in the heavens where moth and rust can't destroy, where thieves can't break in and steal. So help us, Lord, to treasure up our treasures in the heavens. Because wherever our treasure is, Lord, that's where our hearts are. And we want our hearts to be right with you. And we ask these things in the precious and the glorious and the holy name of Jesus. Amen.